É, primeiro, agradecer à nossa sociedade pelo convite. É, eu vejo que o trauma começa a tomar importância, acho que alguns os que me conhecem sabem que eu milito e, e gosto muito do trauma há muitos anos, e, e, tem uma, e, e a gente tenta ter uma visão um pouco diferente, não tão setorizada como existe, por exemplo, o cirurgião vascular, o vessoa vascular, o cirurgião geral, eu acho que o, a, o cirurgião do trauma ele tem que ser, como o Rubens mostrou, um cirurgião completo. É, no ano passado, a gente teve um congresso mundial, que a nossa sociedade também participou de trauma no Rio de Janeiro. Foi um sucesso, a gente liderou o grupo, a gente conseguiu liderar aqui com mais de 4 mil inscritos e foi bastante interessante e, é, o crescimento da visão tanto de todas as especialidades, vendo tá uma especialidade que trabalha de uma forma mais generalizada, vamos dizer, nós temos que aprender a fazer de tudo um pouco. É, já, já abro aqui o convite, nós, é, a sociedade de, que lidera o trauma no, no Brasil, que é a SBITE, tem agora um núcleo no Rio de Janeiro, a gente está comandando isso, e a gente, no mês que vem, já vai começar a primeira é, reunião científica da sociedade de trauma. Então, vai aqui para aqueles que têm interesse em trauma, que procurem a gente, que a gente comece a trabalhar junto, junto, inclusive, com a sociedade, está sempre ao nosso lado, o Rossi, aqui. Comentando o Rubens, não há nada mais difícil na cirurgia do trauma que a cirurgia dos grandes, que o trauma dos grandes vasos e da horta, né? principalmente. Por quê? Principalmente quando a gente olha o trauma fechado, é, a horta no, nos Estados Unidos, que há dados estatísticos mais fiéis, a, a horta é a segunda causa de mortalidade, o trauma de horta. Então é, é, um, é realmente uma coisa, é um, é, um, é um problema epidemiológico extremamente importante. Né, e saber lidar com isso é importante para o cirurgião vascular. E muitas vezes o cirurgião vascular, perdido só na sua especialidade, não consegue ver o doente do trauma como um todo. É, eu acho que, sim, alguns dados importantes, porque foram passados é, que foram, é, pouco tempo né, pelo Rubens, mas é, na, na, na cirurgia dos grandes vasos, eu acho que existe um, um, uma barreira, um limite importante para aquele que vai ter que ser operado de forma urgente, emergente ou não, é, que é a injúria pleural. Se eu tenho injúria pleural e esse sangue vai para a cavidade, esse doente não pode perder tempo. E, às vezes, a gente fica preso em, em, em cirurgias, hoje, realmente mirabolantes, cirurgias híbridas e endovasculares, perdendo tempo de um paciente que tem que, ser, é, que tem que se agir com rapidez e saber por onde entrar, como, ele, como, como o Rubens colocou muito bem. No tórax, no abdômen é muito fácil. A cisão mediana resolve tudo. No tórax, se você entrar para um lugar errado, provavelmente você não vai conseguir resolver o problema desse paciente. Então, o aprendizado, isso é que é a grande questão aqui nessa mesa, é como tanto o cirurgião vascular quanto o cirurgião geral, e como ele vai fazer para aprender. Nas nossas faculdades, a gente não tem essa opção. Não existe o um ensino do trauma como uma coisa importante. E isso eu acho que é fundamental, unir as especialidades para que todos aprendam e aqueles que gostem de fazer aquele determinado segmento da, 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 da cirurgia, que é a cirurgia do trauma, aprenda como um todo, para que a gente não fique perdido simplesmente em especialidade. Dando continuidade aqui à nossa sessão, vamos falar sobre trauma vascular pélvico. Convido o doutor Christian para dar a nossa palestra. Bom, esse homem aqui, cuidando da segurança do seu estado, é muito difícil. Uh, I have nothing to disclose regarding this uh, particular presentation. Pelvic trauma, uh, pelvis is a non-compressible cavity that has significant and complex relationships with neurovascular anatomies. And uh, a little facts about pelvic fractures. Most bleeding uh, comes from the venous system, bone fractures, the lumbar veins that are ripped. Overall, the utilization of pelvic angiography is actually low. But arterial bleeding accounts for 50 to 80% of patients who are hemodynamically unstable uh, and they have pelvic fractures. So that's kind of a key message to remember. Uh, they are classified by mechanisms, lateral compression, AP compression, or vertical shear, and each one of these mechanisms are associated with some injuries. Abdominal visceral injuries are more common in lateral compressions. Urologic injuries are common in AP compressions. Neurologic deficits upon arrival with pelvic fractures are the most important long-term outcome predictor. Urologic compressions are actually quite uh, prevalent as well, about 30% or so. So when patients with multi-trauma come and we identified on primary survey they have a pelvic fracture, 
as you know, pelvic x-ray is part of the primary survey, the very first thing we need to stratify the patient is based on their hemodynamic status. So if the patient is stable, as you can see, we'll have the time to send the patient to the CT scanner, which is the modality of choice to evaluate these patients. If the patient is unstable, the number one thing we need to do is to rule out extra pelvic source of bleeding. And we have several techniques and, and tests that I'll talk about a little bit. And then we need to move on to pelvic source finding and management. Stable patients defined usually by a systolic blood pressure upon arrival to the trauma bay more than 90 millimeters of mercury. They'll go ahead and get a contrast CT scan. And there's a lot of information we'll gather from it, predictors of bleedings we'll discuss in the future. In uh, the unstable patients, hypothermia, covalopathy, and acidosis must be uh, avoided at all costs. Temporary binders are quite useful, and the one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one resuscitation is actually currently the approach to massive transfusion protocols. When you have a hemodynamically unstable patient, uh, orthopelvic device will be applied to the patient. We need to rule out extra pelvic source of bleeding, and again, we need to think about the modalities that we can use to achieve pelvic hemostasis. The Eastern Association for Trauma Surgery in the 2011 update guidelines asked several questions uh, and gave recommendations about the management of the pelvic fractures. Regarding external mechanisms for stabilization, you'll have binders, you've got the external fixation systems or the C-clamps. They certainly reduce the volume of the pelvis, which is open in all cases for this kind of uh, unstable fractures, but they may or may not limit the, the, he the hematoma of the pelvis. Uh, so when analyzed uh, in the literature, they really concluded that they are effective reducing fractures, but they do not seem to limit the hemorrhage based on the available literature. So they were given to utilize these systems a level three recommendation. So certainly they are useful for uh, prevention of further dislodgement of bone structures, but do not work for hemorrhage control. Now what patients require emergent angiography? And these were the highest level of evidence given, and they were given a level one. Any patient with hemodynamic instability after non-pelvic sources were ruled out has to have an angiography. Or any patient who is stable and went to CT scan, and on CT scan we found a contract stabilization sign, those patients must go to angiography. Now, a level two recommendation, a little bit less, but any patient who is age older than 60 with major pelvic fracture should be considered for emergent angiography. And again, anybody who had uh, angiography with or without embolization who had recurrent blood pressure problems and again extra pelvic bleeding has been ruled out should be considered for repeat angiography as well. The way that we do uh, our uh, procedures, we access the common femoral artery under ultrasound guidance, usually contralateral to the pelvic lesion. If we can, you need to remove the binder or cut through it. If the patient is an extremist, we actually have utilized balloon occlusion techniques of the aorta for uh, acute hemostasis. We perform an AP aortogram first to rule out extra uh, pelvic source of vascular injury, and then we go ahead and perform with the proper angles pelvis angiogram. These are just examples of our cases with flushes in different branches of the uh, pelvic circulation. Uh, once you uh, discover the actual bleeding, you selectively catheterize the hypogastric, and again, if the patient is unstable, we'll perform a non-selective hypogastric embolization. If the patient is stable, then at that time we'll go ahead and try to subselect uh, with catheterization and embolize more selectively. Regardless, we always take the contralateral route and we always do a contralateral hypogastric run with the lay face just in case uh, there is some injury on the other side. We tend to leave the sheets uh, in place until the patient coagulopathy uh, and blood pressure has corrected. These are the agents we use. Thrombin and gel foam is a reabsorbable thing, so we tend to use this quite often in non-selective embolizations, and we essentially wipe out the whole hypogastric system, and eventually actually it's reabsorbable about a week or so. Coils are a little more expensive. They certainly are very precise in terms of delivering the target, and we tend to use them more in the subselective setting when we do subselective catheterizations. I personally have no experience with glue in trauma. And this is uh, gel foam being uh, infused in an inferior gluteal artery and resolution of the uh, blush that you can see here on the right side of the screen. Uh, the results of you should expect from pelvic angiography embolization is a primary success rate from 85 to 97 percent. There's about 5 to 25 percent of patients that will require embolization back 
despite successful embolization or not finding any active bleeding at the time of your angiogram. And the risk factors are pointed here, transfusion of more than two units per hour before the angio, findings of more than two vessels, repeat hypotension after initial angiogram, absence of intraabdominal injury is actually a predictor of re-bleeding, and a persistent acidosis expressed by base deficit. There's really low grade of complications for these procedures. There's occasional reports of femoral access injuries. The most common one is an increase in the G, uh, uh, creatinine in these patients. And very rarely, you'll have actually uh, gluteal ischemia or pelvic ischemic syndromes. Very, very rarely. These patients are young, and they tend to tolerate even bilateral hypogastric uh, embolizations quite well. In terms of what is the best study to rule out intraabdominal bleeding, the conclusion as a level one is the FAST, the ultrasound exam, is specific enough to indicate a laparotomy when there is a pelvic fracture. So if you got a pelvic fracture and the FAST is positive, you should take the patient to the open room and open the abdomen first. But FAST is not sensitive enough to exclude intraabdominal bleeding in the presence of pelvic fracture. In a sense, if you have a negative exam with a pelvic fracture, you cannot rely on the fast to take, not to take the patient to the open room and something else needs to happen. DPL seems to be the best test for intraabdominal bleeding and in patients who have, uh, uh, are stable uh, hemodynamically with a pelvic fracture, probably CT scan is better than the fast result. Uh, when you take those patients to the CT angio, you may find certain things. The most important thing we're looking for is uh, IV contrast extravasation. When you have that sign as a positive, you have a 60 to 80 percent specificity of the need for an angiography. So it's mandated once you have a acute blush like the pitting in this particular slide, you will need to take the patient for emergent angio. The absence of uh, IV contrast extravasation actually is a very good negative predictor of future need for angiography. Uh, also, you can see hematomas. There are more than 500 uh, centimeter cubics. You may need to take the patient to the angio. That's a level two recommendation. And the type of fracture does not correlate with the risk of bleeding. In terms of the uh, preperitoneal packing, there's really not a lot of evidence in the United States about it. It's being used more in Europe than in the United States, and they were given a uh, level three recommendation. In summary, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Chairman, hemorrhage from pelvic fracture remains a difficult problem facing the trauma surgeon. Emergent external fixation used to control hemorrhage is not supported by the available literature. And geography for control of hemorrhage is supported by the highest level of evidence with high success rates and minimal complications. Pelvic angiography with embolization can be performed bilaterally if needed and even repeated to control bleeding without undue consequences. The fast examination, although highly specific, does not have the sensitivity to rule out extra pelvic abdominal source of hemorrhage with major pelvic fractures. The use of CT scan with a finding of IV contrast extravasation is a highly predictive test of active bleeding and is certainly supported by the literature as an indication for angiogram. Pelvic packing is an effective tool. It is complementary to laparotomy and its role in the management of pelvic hemorrhage without intraabdominal source remains unclear. Thank you very much for your attention.